You've got a big beat. I'm sorry, don't tell anyone. <laughs> now, Clint, if you want to climb on top of me again. Oh, oh that's oh. me. Oh. Uh oh, Clint. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's attacking! It's attacking! Andrew, it doesn't like you. Oh, dude. <laughs> no! <laughs> it's the food. It, it wants it wants some of the food, food, dude. You've got pancakes Take and it out. wants them. Pancakes. Give it. Give, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, don't, don't run. I don't think he's gonna do anything. Well, I'm yeah. not. I'm not gonna take the risk. Uh, I, I don't Ooh. Think he's not gonna do anything. I'll sacrifice just for fun. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> yummy food for you. Go get this. No, I'm not over here. <laughs> I think that's it. People have been feeding him and he's begging. That's quite a bill you have. <laughs> you feel so awkward. I think he feels awkward about his bill. I think he feels awkward that like he didn't get any food. And now he's just like, oh, I'm ashamed. <laughs> He's just ashamed. Look, the people have turned him into a beggar. Hey, Clint, what do you want to find tomorrow morning? Field Biology is a course offered every two years by DeSales University, during which students learn about and travel to the various ecosystems within a particular geographic region. In late December of 2012, eight students, including myself, led by Dr. Joe Colosi, traveled by van down the east coast of the United States to Florida, where we would learn about the diversity of that state's natural flora and fauna and the conservation efforts being taken to protect them. We camped and cooked our own food. A typical day consisted of getting up early, driving to a particular ecosystem, taking a nature hike, then probably another nature hike, grabbing a quick lunch, and perhaps taking a boat tour, visiting a historical site, or participating in a conservation project. After that, another nature hike, then dinner, and much needed sleep. We set out from DeSales University in Center Valley, Pennsylvania, and traveled down to Huntington Beach State Park in South Carolina where we spent the night before moving on to Little Talbot Island State Park in the upper northeast corner of Florida. From there, we traveled south and inland to Blue Springs and then Highlands Hammock State Parks, also spending a day at the Archibald Biological Station, as well as visiting conservation areas in the Lake Okeechobee region. From there, it was off to the southernmost tip of Florida, where we spent a day on both Key Largo and Big Pine Key before moving on to the enormous Florida Everglades. We spent our final nights in Collier Seminole State Park near the Gulf of Mexico, visiting the Corkscrew Swamp Wildlife Preserve before setting out on the long drive home. This short video journal will take you with us through the diverse natural habitats that we had the privilege of experiencing over the course of our journey. The first ecosystem we visited was the beaches and dunes of Huntington Beach State Park in South Carolina. We began in Climax Forest behind the dunes and walk to the beach, stopping to examine our surroundings along the way. Succession is a major concept in ecology. And that's the idea that um, when some land has been cleared of the native vegetation, there's a sequence of plants and animals that follow uh, leading to the end point, which is the climax. Climax depends on the climate and also on soil factors. In Pennsylvania, the climax is uh, beech, maple, oak, uh, hickory. Those are the trees that you would see in a mature forest. In, in most of the southeast coastal plain, the climax forest is a pine forest. But that depends on fire. If the fire is suppressed, you, that goes to an oak forest. You can see how the plants that are further up have this wedge shape. They go down toward the front and they go uh, higher toward the back. 
The reason there's no climax forest here is the salt spray doesn't allow them to, uh, to grow. <coughs> and so we've got this back dune vegetation, which has some species that are found on the fore dune. Does anyone know what this is? This is a, this is a dominant sand dune former in the southeast. It goes all the way up to Virginia. Seagrass, sea Sea oats. This is sea oats. This is uh, seashore elder. And it's related to uh, uh, ragweed. These flowers look a lot like ragweed. And it's another uh, beach and, and dune building. down for you Andrew. There he is. The next day found us over 300 miles to the south on Little Talbot Island State Park in Florida. We set out early for the beach but spent time in the park's salt marshes and climax forests hanging rich with epiphytes on our way there. Dr. Colosi identified a large variety of plants, pointing out the subtle ways that they were different, even from the similar ecosystem we had observed the day before. And this is related to seashore elder. Remember I showed you that shrub on the beach? This is marsh elder. It's in the same genus, Iva. They have glands that secrete salt, and that's how they regulate. The leaves on this grass come off, like two will come off this way, the next two will come off that way, and then it keeps alternating. And that arrangement is disticus, and the genus of this is disticulus. Now this is supposed to be edible. Who's going in for it? I'll eat it. Salty? Tastes bad. Pretty good. Like salt gushers. Yeah. <laughs> so the flowers are actually really small. Let me pull, I'll pull. Oh one of these off. I know, Andrew. So on this one section of the flower, there's actually a bunch of little flowers. All of these flowers have little uh, pedicels that attach to the peduncle, and they're all attached at the same place. If you look at the inflorescence, um, these little branches are all attached at the same place to the stem. The name for that form of inflorescence is called umbel. We're gonna walk parallel to the ocean in the mature climax live oak forest and then we're gonna walk you know where the vegetation is getting thinner and thinner as we get to the ocean. Uh, Professor Colosi, what is this one that looks like human genitalia? Smilax. We awoke the next day at our campsite near Orange City, Florida, to a very strange sound. What are these? <laughs> it's dancing. The noisy pair of sandhill cranes went on their way as we packed up camp and headed to Blue Spring State Park. Kristen, give a little Yeah! <laughs> Feel the love. Feel the love. See a manatee today? From that to this. 
there's a man over there. Why they thought it was a paradise. Why they thought they could find oh, there's another one. a fountain of youth. Little did we know, we wouldn't just be seeing a few manatees, but hundreds who spend their winters in the geothermally heated waters of Blue Spring. Look at him, here he comes. Oh my god! They're going to call you man for I want to hug yeah. it. <laughs> Nicole, what do you think of the manatees? Are they sparkly? They're sparkly. They should have a sparkly dye. Oh, that's a big one. Oh my! Oh it's dear, like Nicole, it's not manatee. jumping out at you. Holy. Maybe that's the mama manatee. Cold. Let me over here in the spring. He learned how to use, how to use his flippers. <laughs> that afternoon, we took a boat tour on which Dr. Colosi made an exciting prediction. First alligator sighting. Never miss, never <laughs> miss. Lots and lots of big alligators in the Everglades. I've never heard that before. Dishes are done, we're ready to go. So much Florida wildlife. We hit the trails early the next morning, leaving our crowded campsite in Highlands Hammock State Park behind. Here, we had the opportunity to explore ancient hammock forests, cypress swamps, and orange groves, where we could pick the naturally grown oranges right off the trees. You can see the leaves come off in three different directions. See that? So that's a sedge. That's a great white egret. Ooh, it's got a fish. There's a wild bob. It's a feral bob. There you go. Can't Things walk come there. in all different sizes. Things that are wrong. They're all like over, over there. Actually, there's a lot over there. Oh, there's good ones here. This is delicious. Beautiful. Very fleshy, though. Yeah, these do have a lot of flesh on them. Flesh the white stuff. We ended our day with a trip to the scrub one of the more interesting but less appreciated ecosystems that we had the opportunity to visit. So why would these, why would there be endangered plants and animals in the scrub? This land desirable for development. Yeah, this is prime development land. It's high, high ground, <coughs> never gonna flood. Much of the scrub has been converted into asphalt and roofs and roads and sidewalks. And strip mall. We need, more, we need strip mall, more strip mall. So galls are formed from plant tissues. The plant makes the gall, but the plant isn't the architect of the gall. A mother insect lays her eggs on the plant. When the eggs hatch, they uh, secrete chemicals that are like plant hormones. So these chemicals secreted by the larvae of the insect cause the plant to build these structures. And they also cause the plant to send photosynthate. That's the product of photosynthesis, basically sugar. And that's what they grow up on. And then when they mature, they drill a hole in the gall and they emerge. Other insects will um, uh, get into the gall and either grow up there or will eat the insect that's in the gall. And so you've got like several layers of, of organ, organisms that are taking advantage of this situation. Following a brief introduction to the scrub, we spent the next day at Archibald Biological Station, where we met Mark Dayrup, a leading ecologist in insect research and an expert on the scrub ecosystem as well.
Mark gave us a tour of his Archibald Research Office, the large cluttered space where he and his fellow researchers have spent years collecting and categorizing all of the known insects in South Florida. We were particularly impressed with Mark's countless intricate drawings of ants and other insects that covered the room. After the tour, we set out into the scrub, following Mark's lead in search of the endangered scrub jay, an interesting bird that is extensively researched because of the species' unique cooperative breeding habits. We didn't see any scrub jays in the area, but Mark pointed out some different types of scrub inhabitants while we searched. So most of the scrub oaks have pretty wide distributions. They may look different from place to place. This is Chapman oak. It has flatter, thinner, shinier leaves, and they, they tend to be somewhat lobed, slightly more like northern oaks. One, one of the characteristics of in a pine oak is the leaves are like curled and stick up. Those are, those are drought adaptations probably. The kind of thing we wanted to look at hasn't been well worked out for this group of grasshoppers, so. And this is a larva? Yeah. But this is scrub palmetto, and it has these little fibers on the edges of the leaves. Scrub jays use those for their, to line their nests. Scrub oak. Mark noticed a group of scrub oaks that looked suitable for scrub jay nesting, but we didn't see any sign of them. Uh, the scrub jays are lying low. We just have a chance to see one. What is that? Scrub jay? Back there? Is the scrub jay coming? Is it right there? Right there. Oh. Just going up. That's just a vulture up there. Having successfully found a whole family of scrub jays, we climbed into a pickup truck and set out in search of another endangered species with a researcher named Stephen. We met up with Dr. Eric Menges, a well-known botanist, to search a nearby wildlife preserve for the Zizifus plant, a native to the scrub that was once believed to be extinct, but was only recently rediscovered and reintroduced. Because so few specimens exist, any discovery of wild Zizifus would be a major find in the botany field. So then do we get credit in the research papers? Yes, sure. <laughs> Pictures awesome. in the report and everything. <laughs> we set out with high hopes after our success with the scrub jays. But after hours of traipsing through saw palmetto, we were exhausted and unsuccessful in finding any wild Zizifus. The experience nonetheless proved to be a valuable lesson. That natural diversity is something to be protected and preserved. Because that diversity begets more diversity, advancing adaptation and continuing the cycle of change that shapes our world. Helping to preserve that cycle at the federal level is Steve Schubert. He and his associate Lisa manage water conservation in the Lake Okeechobee region. We visited them at a stormwater conservation area, where they explained some of the water management projects being undertaken by the government. This is an intake canal. This was a constructed intake canal, obviously, to get the water from Taylor Creek to the intake here. And what happens is when the water is being pumped in, this trash rake will collect any vegetation and prevent it from going in and um, clogging up the pumps. And the water is pumped right into the stormwater treatment area. So this is where it all starts. Not just a conservation area for water, we also encountered an abundance of wildlife in these man-made ponds. You want a picture with it, Nicole? Let's see how close he lets me get. It. I want to catch a gator biting on. Go any closer. Wow, that was cool. <laughs> there he there is, he is out there. Steve then took us to the shores of Lake Okeechobee, where he explained to us the importance of this enormous body of fresh water for all of the ecosystems in South Florida. He is working to repair the damage that humans have done to the natural distribution of this water, but it is a long, difficult process that will take many years to complete. After lunch, we took a fun break to go seining on the St. John's River.
At the end of the day, we said goodbye to Steve and began to head out for the Florida Keys. Our first stop in the Keys was a turtle hospital that assisted in disease research, rescue, and rehabilitation of the five different types of sea turtles found in Florida. Our large tour group was given a presentation on the different types of turtles and the problems that their populations face as pollution and fishing claim more of their lives each year. We were also able to take a look at the facilities at the hospital used to care for injured turtles before going outside to the tanks where the patients were kept. There, we saw turtles with many different types of injuries, ranging from fatigue to missing limbs, to the fibropapillomavirus, which affects green turtles and causes the growth of tumors all over their bodies. The final tank was home to those turtles who could not return to the wild because of long-term injuries and must remain permanent residents of the turtle hospital. Our next stop was the National Key Deer Refuge, but we didn't really need to go that far to find the key deer. In fact, they were more common in our campsite than anywhere else. There he is, there's Glenn. Yeah. What you were eating while I was gonna say, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Nicole, write that down. Cactus. <laughs> good work, Nicole. Bob found a snail. Good work, Bob, let's take a look. Nicole, are you still writing stuff down? Wow, Nicole, how dedicated. Oh, hello there, all over all spring. If only you could smell it. That's amazing. You think so, Kristen? Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> Nicole, you gotta jump. There goes 20 bucks, Bob. I got 10, you got 10. Okay, thanks, Bob. Catch your guy. It was time to get serious again. We were off to the Everglades, and we had no idea how much was in store for us there. Andrew, you know how to do the J stroke? What did you hear? Gator. Holy He's right here. I've never heard that before. Wow. Shh. Bobo. Look forward, Bob. Let's fix her. I have never heard that. That, I, this is the first time, this is my tenth, my seventh trip, and that's the only time I've ever heard that.
Can I sit next to you? Thank you. As we watch the sunrise the morning after our first day in the Everglades, I realize that one cannot put a price on what a place like this has to offer. People have always looked at this land wondering how they could use it. I'm beginning to realize that it may be the most beautifully useless place in the world. Crikey, I'm Steve Irwin, and we're here hunting the American alligator. We're looking for the biggest, the ferocious American alligator. Look at the coloration of those alligators. They are just beauties. Beauty, look at the jaw on that one. It's open and it's getting some air. All joking aside, our time in the Everglades was amazing but it was time to move on. Our trip was quickly coming to a close, and it was time to reflect on what I personally wanted to take away from it. Not being a science major, I didn't look at all of this and see genus and species, cellular biology, or organic chemistry. I saw the experience, taking my time and observing the value of nature for its own sake. To me, Corkscrew Swamp was the perfect place to bring an end to our trip. Here we saw the powerful visual of the beautiful contrast that exists between the diverse ecosystems of Florida. The long span of grass separating one of the last ancient cypress domes from the pine flatland just yards away was an awe-inspiring look at how these two ecosystems, that could not be more different, have survived side by side for thousands of years, growing and adapting as the world changed around them. If there ever was a lesson that humanity should take from the natural world, it could be found here in the idea that not everything around us needs to be harnessed and controlled. The scrub and Sisyphus, the key deer, the alligator, even the vast Everglades don't exist to serve anyone or anything. They just exist and adapt and change. That is something we need to learn how to do better without harming the world around us by trying to control it. And these, these are the places that can teach us how. It's me, Jeff Corbin again, and we're here in Ding Darling, and we are looking at the wonderful rosiest moon. Look at the pink and white coloration on this animal. It is just magnificent. I'm telling you, magnificent. This beak is able to get any plant or fish it wants. It is shaped like a spoon.